Folger, very good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. This is episode number 48. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> episode number 48. Dachid is the Hocht. And you're all very welcome along this evening. Where we're going to be talking more about Laura Gawala and in particular the story of the arrival of the Tua de Danon. Last night, uh, we had a longer than uh, usual episode and uh, I thought perhaps people's appetite for uh, redactions two and three of the story mightn't have been that um, uh, plentiful. But there were, seemed to have been a high demand to continue the story. So that's what we're going to do. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. I suppose we should spare a thought, shouldn't we, for a moment for all the victims of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, I think in Ireland we had 59 deaths today. Uh, which I could be mistaken is uh, the, probably the highest single daily total, or it's certainly up there. And so it looks like the um, semi-lockdown that we're in is going to continue for a while. Uh, and to give a thought to all the families of those who've lost uh, the battle against the disease, and of course to all the frontline staff, especially those in the hospitals and the health services and the nursing homes who are facing a very difficult task with it all. One of the reasons that we're doing this, and the main reason that we're doing this, is to try and uh, distract us a little bit. And it, okay, it doesn't help, it, it doesn't do any harm to occasionally just reflect on what has us here on either side of a phone screen or a, a tablet or an iPad screen or, or a laptop or whatever. Um, and that is that uh, we've all been moved indoors, as it were, while this is going on. Uh, I've enjoyed it greatly, but at the same time, um, there is a sober cause uh, or reason for it uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and so our hats off uh, and our best regards to all those who are helping to fight the fight. On YouTube this evening, the first of the commenters is Daisy Peters, who's one of our regular watchers, viewers from uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Very welcome, uh, Daisy. Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony and all here again from sunny California, ready to listen to my new daily ritual. Thank you so much for sharing yourself with us, Jackie. It's a great pleasure and it's lovely to have you along. Sharon Disney says, hello, everyone from Dallas, Texas. Philip Blair says, aloha from Washington State in USA. We have a particular concentration of viewers on the west coast of the United States, which is fantastic. You're very welcome along, Philip. Amber Lynn says, made it. Yay, brilliant stuff. Gia Gutsch, Amber. Uh, Mez Marion says, hello to all from Marion. Yay, lovely storytelling. Thank you. Blessings for you and yours. Uh, Banakti, uh, Marion, and welcome along. Um, Philip Blair says, phone here. Uh, Amber Lynn says she's in Queen Anne's Maryland. Uh, brilliant stuff. Erica Rivertree, Banachti, two of the Mythflix. It's lovely to see you, Erica. Uh, welcome along, as always. Karen Gogus is watching on YouTube. Hello, Anthony and dear friends from Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> I'll be on YouTube since it works better for me for now than Facebook. Okay, no problem. Karen, always a great pleasure to have you in the house. And on Facebook, the first of the commenters tonight is Yvette Tillema. Greetings to a Falsha Yvette. Pat Rowan is watching from Washington State. Hello, Pat. Terry Lynn Zaharias is in Colorado. Hello, Terry Lynn Falche. Judy McQueen says hello all. Gia Glitch. Kirsten Salisbury says hello all. Gia Glitch. Kirsten, good evening to you. Rob Best and Bostel says blessings to all. Banachti. Tosafain, Rob. Jack Durkin says hi, everyone. Hello, Jack Falche. Fidel McKelly Howard says hello all. Gia Glitch. Sean Fitzgerald. Greetings, Anthony from Donegal. Looking forward to the stories this evening. Sean, it's lovely to have you on board, and I hope you're perhaps able to create some new works of art uh, while you're in uh, semi-lockdown. Josephine Meehan says, Tranonua, Anthony and Tua, you're very welcome along, Josephine Freya. Shoholm says, Banakti, Anthony, and all the lovely Tua. Thank you, Freya, and you are very, very welcome to Live Irish Mits, episode 48. Alex Casterton is saying, evening, Anthony, Tranonua. And evening to it. Ralph Waldron, good evening. We are going to have rain. I can't remember where you said you were, Ralph. Um, it's gotten very grey here. I mean, it was kind of, it was a mixture of sunshine and cloud today, but it was a nice day. Kristen Gray Taggart, Geogrush to Anthony and the two up from California. Nice to have you along, Kristen. Thalia Brown is in Glastonbury and is here for more wonderful tales. Hopefully we can feed your appetite. 
Louise Sherrill says, hello, Geogritch Louise, Barbara Kling. Hello, everyone. Greetings from sunny Vermont. And uh, pass some of that sunshine along, Barbara. Do us a favor. Thanks a million. You're very welcome along. Fidelma, Kelly, Howard. Well, Anthony, how are you, Fidelma? Lovely to have you along. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hi, Aaron. Federica Guy. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Tua from the rainy Torino, Italy. This lockdown is like an endless nightmare, but Mythflix is a ray of light during this dark period. Glad to be able to shine a light, uh, Federica. And our thoughts are with you. I read something today about uh, is this, uh, Slovakia, uh, where they're thinking of coming out of lockdown and they're discussing easing restrictions here, but I can't see it happening with the rates with the, the death rate from today. Louise Sherrill is sending hearts. Vicky Highlands, really looking forward to tonight's episode. Tucked up in bed, ready to listen. Been absent from the last few, so really pleased to be able to watch tonight. And we are delighted to have you along, Vicky. Falche. Mark Ledger, 5 a.m. here in the tropics of North Australia, Townsville. Lockdown is easing this week weekend as cases in our region are zero. Uh, and a, a friend of mine who's an Australian on... Um, on Facebook, Mark, uh, has been giving the figures for new cases, uh, and it's incredibly low in Australia. You've done a fabulous job. So hopefully you'll get to, you know, roam around a little bit more freely in the next few days. Michael Naylor, Mike and Jeanette are in Princeton in New Jersey. Hello, my New Jersey and friends. Aaron Durrett says, yay for the left coasters. Howdy, lovely Tua. Melanie Lynn is watching. Hi, Melanie. Bob. Best in Boston says, NYC right now, Vermont later, New Hampshire home. Wow. Alan Cardoso da Silva says, Giaguich o Rio de Janeiro. And we have another Rio de Janeirian in the house. I don't know whether that's what you say. Alan, it's lovely to have you along. Desiree Riley. Hello to it. It is Desiree from Louisiana. I've missed every one of the last few days because of my mosquito allergy. We saw, I, I certainly saw the picture on... Um, the mythical Ireland community, and it does look painful. So happy to be back to live episodes and so happy to receive my mythical Ireland book yesterday. Brilliant. And I think you may have got the second last copy or the third last copy. All of my mythical Ireland copies are now gone. Uh, and I don't know how I'm going to get more copies, but I'm hoping to do so in the next week or two. Christine Buckley says, hello, Gia Glitch. Christine, Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony. Hi, Barbara, how are you? Lorna Evers Monaghan, evening upside down face. <laughs> hello, or Lorna, how are you? Melanie Lynn is saying, hello, all. Maeve Fina Callaghan, Gia Glitch Tua, Gia Reeve Tua from Portland, Oregon. Lovely to have you in the house, as always, Maeve. Paul Cullen, Gia Glitch, Julie in Utah. Brilliant stuff. Mariana Dunn is in rainy Alexandria in Virginia. Happy to be here. Happy to have you here. Pamela Walters, do you leave from the Netherlands? Brilliant, Pamela. Reese Casterton says, hail, good to a. And good evening to you. Julie Staker says, hi, Paul. Hi, Julie. Uh, I'm not Paul, but I'm saying hello anyway. <laughs> Theresa McGuinness says, it's a sunny, crisp day in Callaghan in Florida, working on my pond earlier break for story time how wonderful that sounds really nice laura o'reilly is saying hello from madrid and from uh, our we give a very big special wave and lots of hugs to our friends in spain with whom mythologically we have so many connections christine buckley love new hampshire Brilliant. Brian Murphy is watching. Must be hard up for entertainment. <laughs> Hope O'Sheen is watching. Trisha Yoder, hello from Elkhart, Indiana. You're very welcome along, Trisha Falcha. Susan Miller is watching from Virginia. Hi, Susan. Good evening to you. Muvanway says hello again from rainy Bristol. I really enjoyed yesterday's reading. I first read The Battle of Moitura two years ago, and it took me down a huge Irish rabbit hole, which I've enjoyed very much. That is my permanent story these days, Muvanway, and it's lovely to have you along. Falcha. Laura McCormick, evening to all from Laura McCormick, Legends Abu Anton. Hi, Laura, fault you. Pull up a, a stool, grab a brew or something stronger if you're having it, and we'll tell a few stories. Eve Bondrot, is that, uh, is that French? Bondrot? Bondrot? Uh, hi, friend. Hello, Eve. Good evening, Eve. 
Molly Michelle Kopeski says hello everyone looking forward to another day of stories from the Lower Gawala Aaron it's raining here today in Minnesota which is perfect weather for this well I suppose if you're still if you're indoors yes you don't mind if it's raining outdoors Dave Russell love the new Mythflix logo Antoine hi hi everyone Antoine, sorry, I'm saying Antoine because it looks like the French. Slovakia has the right idea. A beautiful place if you get a chance to visit Bratislava. The Mythflix logo, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to uh, very quickly because I, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name who uh, posted it today. Um, it, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember. So I'm just going to have to scroll down on the page and give credit to Barry Phelan. So thank you, Barry. It's a mock-up. Netflix, Mythflix, uh, Chimera. Aaron Pixie Cusick says, hello, Geoglitch from Florida, where you're under a tornado watch. Oh, no. Stay safe, Aaron. Jack Durkin says, it'll end by 2021. I hope you're right, Jack. And if it ends sooner than that, even better again. Patricia McAteer is watching one of our locals from Omeath in the Cooley Peninsula. Lovely to see you, Patricia. Andrea Lagoya says, ciao, everybody. Ciao, Andrea. Lovely to have you along. Donna Jean Porter says, hi. Gia Glitch. Henry Paddy Shearman, evening to all. Watching from England, originally from Belfast. Lovely to have you in the house again, Henry. Always a pleasure. Cheryl Ann McFetridge is sending love from Boston. Lovely to have the Bostonians along. Fall to Cheryl Ann. Alan Cardoso da Silva says, in Portuguese, people from Rio de Janeiro are called Cariocas. I know, kind of confusing. I don't even know what that means. So I'm sorry, I can't share in the joke. Patrick Rowan says, hello, Brian. Gemma McGowan is watching. Gemma is in the house. Tashi on show. You're very welcome, Gemma. Gillian Gogarty is watching. Now, she is definitely the, the nearest watcher. Unless my wife tunes in, Gillian lives in the same estate as me. She's only like... <laughs> 50 feet that way or 100 feet that way hello from around the corner says Gillian Falcha, Gillian lovely to see you Jacoy Lee Craft is waving a wave back uh, Gemma says hi Anthony hi Gemma David Galvin is saying hello from West Clare are you right there Michael are you right lovely to have you along David how are things in Clare Laura Odomitroy is in Blessington and Wicklow and says that she cannot wait for your myth tale well, I better get on with it. Simon Tute is in the house. Evening, Anthony, from the Independent Republic of Salins. Always a pleasure to have you in the house. If you don't know who Simon Tute is, Simon is the man behind Monumental Ireland, not to be confused with Mythical Ireland. Uh, equally brilliant. Uh, so get on there on the Facebook page and give him a like. Vicky Highlands. Anthony, if you can take a chance to quickly ask, I have heard there is a burial mount that is rumoured to belong to Lou of the Law Long Arm. Do you happen to know the name? I expect you do. Well, there's one in Louth Village uh, here in County Louth, which is said to be Mota Lou, which is supposedly his burial place. There's also um, the uh, Rathlou, um, not far from the Hill of Tara, uh, just off the <clears throat> M3 motorway that was built, even though nobody wanted it to be built. Uh, so I'm not sure if either of those are your candidates. Demi Woe is in Colorado, says it's a beautiful day here. And it was a beautiful day here, too. I think we sent our weather across the ocean to you, Demi. It's lovely to have you along. Jim Conway is in Lurgan, Geoglitch. Hi, Jim. Welcome along. Todd Desperate is in Ohio. Lovely to see you, Todd. Melina Vasiliki Verikios. First time listening. Hello from Australia. Melina Cade Mila Falche. You're very, very welcome. A hundred thousand welcomes from the uh, the Tua de Mythflix. And I'm sure you'll get a very nice welcome from the other members. Edina Sparks is in New Mexico, where it is sunny. I think it's sunny a lot in New Mexico, is it, Edina? Very nice to see you. Margaret Ring is in the house. Evening all. Good evening, Margaret. How are you keeping? Hope you're well. Kristen Murray Andre is saying greetings from Chicago or reasonably close. Fodja, Kristen. Michael Kenny is watching. Hello, Michael. Long time. No chat. Um, hope you're well. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm full of wind because we only had dinner about half an hour ago. And there you go. Simon is getting a hello on Monumental Ireland. Simon shoot Karn Lugdach at Ishnak. Oh, of course. Sorry. Yes. How could I possibly have failed to mention Yes, sorry. And I mentioned it, uh, Simon. I bloody mentioned it to, in the last couple of episodes. Silly me. I apologise. There's a third candidate for Lou's burial place. 
Okay, okay, okay. I think we're up to date. Hello again from Newfoundland, says Kurt Walsh, who signs on YouTube as the lucky leprechaun. Erica Bow is also watching on YouTube. Good evening, Erica. Trononawa heard a shot who was Tom King in Bohermine. Evening, Anthony, one and all. And one and all, forge a light and working away, broadcast on loudspeaker. Looking forward to story time. Wonderful to see you, Tom, and looking forward to catching up with you very soon. Uh, Paula, who is hemp and asphalt, says, Giri from sunny Pasadena, California. Wonderful to have you in the house. Mary Smith says, good evening, and a merry good evening to you. Melissa O'Brien says, hello, Anthony Giacuch. Joey McDee says, greetings from San Diego. And same to you, Joey Falch. Irish technical thinker, greetings from Belfast. Mark and Rachel watching by the fire with some fine mead, honey made from the Boyne River honeybees. God bless you all. Well, that sounds just sublime. And in fact, if we weren't isolated, we could all meet up and do a storytelling session and we could maybe share a bit of that mead. Looking forward to the time that we can do that. And uh, Ninky Stratton says, so excited. Love to you from America. Very nice to have you along, Ninky. Lars of Mars says, hello, Anthony. Greetings from Gleska. And John Smith is in Austin in Texas. Mandy McCurl says, hello from Mull. Not so sunny today, but still lovely. Sounds a bit like our weather here. Uh, okay, are we up to date there? <sighs> what time are we on? 16 minutes. Uh, the Lucky Leprechaun. Seamus Marr. Hello from along the Clanroy River. Newry Ulster listing. Hello, Seamus. Falche. David Ebel. Anthony, are you familiar with the Welsh tale of King Bran? particularly the cauldron he obtains from an Irish giant that can restore the dead to life. Sounds familiar. Yes, I think I am vaguely familiar with that. Uh, um, maybe we can chat more about that later too. Paul, who is the, the Royal Tara Ranger, says, I, I remember the road being built. The M3 was watching old footage of that long time now. Still call over to Rathlew. Well, not at the moment. <laughs> of course, not at the moment is right. Now, where are we on? We're on 17 minutes exactly. Brilliant. So I can tell the YouTubers later when they're catching up and they don't want to go through all of the hellos because they weren't part of it. I can tell them to skip to 17 minutes. Why you wouldn't want to be part of it though, you know? I know, I know, I know, I know. Second redaction. So last night we were uh, reading from Laura Gowala Aaron, uh, translated by or a Stuart McAllister, the book of the taking of Ireland. And this is part seven or section seven, the two of the Dan. And we had redaction one tonight. We have redaction two and three. And as we were, I think, explaining last night, uh, a redaction is like a, 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 a version, uh, a, a version of the story. Uh, the story of, uh, sorry, the book of invasions, Laura Gowala, comes to us from several manuscript sources. Uh, so. And aren't we lucky uh, that we can compare the different manuscripts and see how they differ? Tonight, I'm going to try and get through the second and third redactions. We only read the first and a little bit of the second, but I think I'll try and kind of move it along if I can a little bit more swiftly tonight. Do you know what I did? I sat down and I forgot to turn on the lights. Uh, so after a few minutes, I might have to get up and switch on the lights. The taking of the Tua de Danon here below. And this is, uh, as we saw yesterday, exactly the same beginning as the, well, the first opening paragraph as the first redaction. Uh, but in the second paragraph, they tried to link the uh, Dedanans to the Athenians, uh, which, of course, is uh, a, a medieval intervention uh, and not a genuine tradition. I'm going to skip the first couple of pages because I did read them last night and we're going to skip on. Actually, look, let's pick it up with the four cities. There were four cities in which the two of the Danon were acquiring knowledge, namely Folius, Gorias, Phineas, Murias. Four sages who were in those cities, Morfessa, who was in Phalius, Ezros in Gorias, Usikius in Phineas, Semias in Murias. Those are the four sages with whom the two a day, the two a day acquired knowledge and science. Fish August Olus Olus. From Gorius was brought the spear of Lu. And this is funny, right? But the story uh, diverges here. So I'll read one side uh, because in on one side it says from for, from Gorius was brought the spear of Lou and on the other side it says from Folius was, was brought the Leofoil. I presume they repeat each other just in different um, in in different uh, orders. From Gorius was brought the spear of Lou, 
and no victory could be won against it, nor against him who had it in his hand. From Phineas was brought the sword of Nuadu Arigatlov, and no man escaped from it when it was drawn from its battle scabbard. From Murish was brought the cauldron of the Dagda. No company would go from it unsatisfied. And from Phalius was brought the stone of Fal to Chower. And it used to cry in their time under every king that should take Chower. Thence is Inish Foil named. And this word that is uh, regularly seen, uh, I think it's Latin uh, at the end of a paragraph, is Kekin, it's C E C I N I T. And that is the first person, no, the third person singular. Um, of uh, cano to the Latin for sing, so it, you know it's it's like you know it has he has sung or he has said. Um, presumably, that's something left over from the time when the tales are actually spoken or sung rather than written down. So, what's interesting about the items, as it were, the great uh, artifacts of the Tuatha de Danann, is that three of them are related to principal deities of the de Danans. There is the sword of Lu, sorry, there's this, the spear of Lu, the sword of Nuadu, and the cauldron of Dagda. Now, all three of those are critically important and are indeed uh, principal deities. They are, as we saw and as we're going to see, uh, they are the kings, Nuadu, who held the kingship for 20 years, and he was the king uh, at the first battle of Moitura and indeed again at the second battle of Moitura. Lu was next. He, he, had, he had the throne for 40 years, and then Dagda was next, and he had the throne for 80 years. So they're lining them up here, aren't they, by, by crediting them uh, with three out of the four great implements that they brought with them. Okay, yes. And the other uh, the other uh, uh, version uh, basically says the same thing, just in a slightly different order. He under whom that stone should cry was king of Ireland, but Cuchulland struck it with his sword, for that it made no cry under him, nor under his fosterling, Louis, son of the three fins of Owen. And from that out, it never made cry, save only under Con, and that is undoubtedly Con Cade Cahak, Con of the Hundred Battles, one of the famous kings of Tara. And so its heart burst out of it from Chower to Talchu. Therefore, Fall's heart is in Talchu. But it was not Louis's failure to take the kingship, which was the occasion of the breaking of the idols, but Christ's birth at that time. <laughs> Can you spot the uh, corruption of the story by the hand of a Christian monk? If you can't, <clears throat> write me a letter. Another company says, however, that it was as a sea expedition that the Tua de Danon came to Ireland and burnt their ships. It was owing to the fog of smoke that rose from them as they were burning that others have said that they came in a fog of smoke. Not so, however, for these are the two reasons why they burnt their ships, that the Fomori should not find them to rob them of them, and that they themselves should not have a way to escape from Ireland, even though they should suffer rout before the Fir Volug. So they didn't want the Fomorians nicking their ships, and also they didn't want to be cowards. So basically, if they faced their enemies, the Fir Volug, but they wouldn't run and flee to the ships, even if things were going ill for them in the battle. Thereafter, the Tua de Danon brought a darkness over the sun for a space of three days and three nights. As for Nuadu Aragatlov, and his name means silver hand, as we were talking about yesterday, it is he who was king over the Tua de Danon for seven years before they came into Ireland, till his arm was cut from him in the first battle of Moitura. It is Ailio, son of Alda, who was the first man that fell in Ireland of the Tua de Danon, by the hand of Nerchu Uas Simeon in the first battle of Moitura. Ernmas, Echtach, Etargal and Fiacha fell in the same battle. Bres, son of Elada, afterwards took the kingship of Ireland till the arm of Nuadu was healed until Bres grandson of Netch, fell in Carney Netch by the Druidry of Lu Father, And that is the same Lu uh, of whom the spear was famous. Thereafter, Nuadu Aragadlov, 20 years. 
a silver arm with full activity in every finger and every joint did Dean Kecht set upon him. And Dean Kecht, of course, is the leech or the physician or the healer of the Tua de Danon. Krejna, the right, helping him. Now, Krejna, I believe, was a worker in bronze, uh, is described somewhere as being a worker in bronze. Um, and I think I think the old Irish for, for bronze is something like curd, C-E-R-D. Um, so the right was helping him. Miach, son of Dean Kecht, set joint to joint and vein to vein of his own hand upon him. And in thrice nine days it was healed. And he took the silver arm as a guerdon. And we, we read last night, G-U-E-R-D-O-N is a reward. And Katrina is in the house and is giving a, a link to a source for what we're reading. It's lovely to have you along, Katrina. And it's it's really interesting because yeah, it's it's really bizarre actually because what the story seems to be suggesting is that Miak actually grew a fleshy arm from his own arm, which was then transplanted onto the silver arm given to Noadu. Now I want to say at this point, if you've ever seen Star Wars and you've ever seen uh, um, The Empire Strikes Back and you've ever seen Luke Skywalker confront uh, uh, Darth Vader and they have a lightsaber battle and Darth Vader chops off his hand. And later in the movie, at the very end, you see Luke Skywalker in the hospital ship and he has had a robotic hand fitted. And there's even one of the droids is testing it, probing the, the different uh, tendons in his arm. And you can see his finger, you can see his fingers reacting as he's doing that. That is entirely based upon the story of Nuado Aragatlov from uh, Kotmoichura and indeed from Laura Gowala uh, and Joseph Campbell, of course, who was uh, uh, a renowned uh, American scholar on um, comparative mythology around the world uh, uh, guided George Lucas's hand on, uh, excuse the pun, no pun intended, uh, uh, that he guided uh, Lucas as to the mythology upon which some of the stories were based. Adele Perth is in the house and Adele is watching from Adelaide where it is probably half four in the morning, something along those lines, ridiculous o'clock. Very nice to have you along. Majin, wa, Adele, and uh, Tranona wa from all of us to you. Just making sure I haven't missed anyone. Tomek Plasianik is watching. I'm not sure if that's how I pronounce your name, Tomek. Uh, but myself and Tomek uh, have been communicating on matters archaeological for a good while now. And Tomek has been of some considerable assistance to me. John McGovern is watching. Hello, John, one of the locals. Dawn Hilton. Hi, Anthony. Love this. You have me hooked. Brilliant. Well, sure, look, you know, we'll keep going anyway and see, you know, <laughs> we'll see how long we can continue. Okay, there's a lot of people chatting among. This is brilliant. Oh, Nolan Proctor is along as well. Thanks, Anthony. You are the lore keeper we need. Well, I'm I'm glad to help try and propagate this stuff because I've started uh, studying all this 21 years ago and it absolutely fascinated me then and the fascination has only grown. Okay, right. I think I think I'm up to date. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Talche, daughter of Mog Moore, king of Spain, queen of the Fir Bullog, or the Fir Volug. She came after setting the battle of Moitura against the Fir Volug to Coil Coan, and the wood was cleared by her so that it became a clovery plain before the end of a year. This is that Talche who was wife of Yohu, son of Urk, king of Ireland. Uh, Yoki Mac Urk, by the way, uh, uh, in addition to being king of Ireland, is effectively the king of the, the Fir Volug. It is Yohu who took her from Spain from her father. As for Talche, she dwelt in Talchu and slept with Yohu Garub, son of Dwi the Blind of the Tua de Danon, and Cian, son of Dian Kecht, otherwise called Skal Balb, gave her his son in fosterage, Lu, to wit. Ethna, daughter of Balor, was his mother, that is Lou's mother. We, we were trying to clear up that confusion yesterday because it wasn't immediately clear uh, who, who Ethna was the daughter of. But Ethna, daughter, or sorry, the mother of. Ethna, daughter of Balor, was Lou Lawfada's mother. Uh, and Lou Lawfada is, of course, also known as Lou Mac Ethna, Lou, son of Ethna. And my own mother's name is Ethna, by the way, by coincidence. Thereafter, Tulcha died in Tulchu, and her name was given thereto. 
and it is her grave which is northeast from the seat of Talchu. Her games were made annually by Lou, a fortnight before Lunasa and a fortnight afterwards. Lunasa, i.e. Nasa, N-A-S-A-D, of Lou Lovefada, the name of that festivity. But basically, the, the Irish version of the Olympic Games, as it were. And we will have an episode about Enoch Talchin, all about the Lunasa Games, initiated by Lou in honour of his foster mother, Talchu, who's said to be buried uh, somewhere near uh, Telltown. Uh, that's the modern name of the place in County Meath, Telltown. Nuadu Aragatlov fell in the last battle of Moitura, along with Macha, daughter of Ernmas, by the hand of Balor Balk Um And, and uh, I, I imagine that's uh, Balor of the Stout Blows or something. I think that's his epithet. Katrina, you might be able to help me with that. Balk, B A I L C, and a separate word. Bevnyak or Bemnyak, B E I M N E C H. In that battle, there fell Ogma, son of Elada, at the hands of Indek, son of the Daunan of the Fomori, the Fomorians. Brunya and Koshmail, the two satirists, fell at the hands of Ultrialak, son of Indek. <clears throat> now, after the death of Nuadu and of those men, Lu took the kingship and his grandfather Balor fell at his hands with a stone from a sling. And ba Balor, which is regularly spelt B-A-L-O-R, is here spelt in the text of, uh, uh, I was going to say Kamaitura, in the text of Lower Gawala is spelt Balar, B-A-L-A-R, Balar. Numbers also fell in that great battle of Maitura, both of the Tua de Danon and, and of the Fomori. As said, Indek, son of the Daunan, the Druid, who was a man skilled in arts and crafts, when Lou asked of him what number fell in the Battle of Moitura. And then there's a poem, which, and for some reason they don't, well, I can probably see why, they don't put the poems in amongst the text. They refer to the poems in, in Roman numerals, and then you have to go to the back and look for the poem. Uh, give me a second and I'll see if it's... Uh, perhaps worthy of reading if it's about the numbers that fell in the battle, which, of course, the numbers are always very significant. We don't understand the significance of them now. L X I V. Seven men, seven score. Oh, yeah, we had this in redaction one. It was included in the main text yesterday. Seven men, seven score, seven hundreds. That is its truth and no lie who fell in the hard battle in Moitura with strong victory. And that's uh, literally one quatrain of a poem. Can't understand why they wouldn't include that in the main text. But anyway, Lou was 40 years in the kingship of Ireland after the last battle of Moitura. There were 27 years between the two battles of Moitura. <clears throat> Cindy Daniels Graven is watching. Hi, Cindy. Uh, Falcha, lovely to see you again. Uh... I wake early these days, says Adele. Can't get me up when I have to go into work. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> I've read some of Joseph Campbell's books. And in one of my later, says Todd Despera, one of my later uh, uh, um, episodes, uh, we will do a continuation of uh, the Mythical Ireland Library. We did one part of it. Vicky Highland says, I thought Miak grew Nuadu in armor flesh with the help of his sister Aramage, but in some retellings I've heard she's not mentioned. Yeah, the, it's just, I think it's just down to different versions, Vicky. You, you find that some details are, are not included in, in some versions, you know? Okay, I think I'm up to speed. Bollock, B A L C, is a beam. Ooh, interesting. Somebody asked there uh, why uh, a slingshot? That's a Katrina answering my earlier question about uh, uh, Balor's epithet, uh, which was... Oh, I can't find it now. See, see how easily I get distracted. Yeah, Balor Balk Benyach. Uh, somebody was asking there why a slingshot and not a spear. It's a very good question, uh, which I have attempted to answer in uh, Island of the Setting Sun uh, 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 in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers. Am I going to give you any more right now? No, I'm not. <laughs> ah, no, I'm only joking. Um, we, we, we may get a chance to explain that uh, later. Now, Yochi Olahar. The great Dagda, son of Elada, was 80 years in the kingship of Ireland. He had the three sons, Angus, Age, and Kermit Cain. 
Over these four, did the men of Ireland erect the mound of the brew? And of course, we had that exactly in the first redaction. Dian Kecht had four sons, Ku, Cian, Kehan, and Mirk. Eten, the poetess, was daughter of Dian Kecht, and Cotpre, son of Eten, or Eten, 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 E T A N. There's actually no uh, fodder on the E like there is in Eten. So Eten, the poet, was daughter of Dian Kecht, and Cotpre, son of Eten, was the poet, and Aramid, the she leech, was the other daughter of Dian Kecht. So there you go. Aramid does get a mention, but not in relation to uh, fashioning the new fleshy arm for Nuadu. Not in this redaction, anyway. Crinbel, Borinia, and Koshmail, the three satirists. Bequila and Danon, the three she husbandsmen. The three sons of Kermat, Milbel, son of Yochu Olahar, were Makol, Makecht, and Magrania. And we said yesterday how, how they mean uh, son, son of the hazel, son of the plough, and son of the sun. Makol, the hazel, his god, Ether, his name. Banba, his wife, Makecht, thereafter, the plowshare, his god, Tether, his name, Fotla, his wife, Magrania, further, the son, his god, Kether, his name, Eru, his wife. And we will get, of course, we are going to do an episode about, about Eru, and we're going to do a separate episode about Ishnak. Geir or Gael, son of Orbson, which was the personal name of Mananon, from whom Loch Orbson is named, when his grave was dug, it is then that the lake burst over the earth. The three sons of Kermat Milbel, son of the Dagda, Makul Makecht Magrania, Ermit, uh, Dermot, and Aid Don were the other names for them. Sehor, Kehor, Tehor were their names. Futla, Eru, Bamboo, their three wives. I'm not sure why that's repeated, by the way, because it's not in a separate column. These were their kings, chieftains, druids, and men of art below. Nuadu, Bres, Lu, Dagda, Delbaith, Fechna, Brian, and Yochar, and Yocharba, the three gods of Dana, i.e. the three druids, from whom the two of the Danon are named, Makul and Makul, Makecht, and Magrania, the three last kings of the two of the Danon. Um, Yes, I saw an explanation for where that idea of the three gods of Dana comes from. It's apparently a corruption of Dawn, uh, as in Dawn, D A F O D A N, your gift, rather than any connection to two of the Dana. Yohu Olahar, i.e., the Dagda, and Ogma, Eloth, Bres, and Dalbaith were the five sons of Elada, son of Dalbaith. Or the sons of Elada, son of Neth, son of Indui, son of Aldui, son of Tat, son of Tabarn, son of Enna, son of Bath, son of Ibath, son of Biohok, son of Yorbonel, the soothsayer, son of Nemed, son of Agnamon. R Rob Bo Best and Bostel says, shoot, got to leave now, but I will look for the episode later to finish. Thanks, blessings to all. No problem. And we're about 37, 38 minutes in, so you'll know where to pick up. Take it easy, Rob, and we'll see you next time. Three sons of Ernmas, Glon and Gnim and Cosker, and Boand, daughter of Delbaith, son of Elida, wife of Nechtan, son of Nama. And here is what we were saying in the introduction, or, or what uh, McAllister was alluding to, that um, because of the serious efforts on behalf of the Christian scribes to euhemorize or, or to make men of the deities, uh, they had to concoct uh, a fairly complex and um, mm -hmm, imagined, um, uh, complicated um, uh, genealogies for them. And so parts of the story are taken up with trying to link all the characters together uh, and their family trees, you know. Eru and Fola and Banba, three daughters of Fechna, son of Delbaith, son of Ogma. Ernmas, daughter of Etherlau, was mother of those women, and she was mother of Fechna and Olam. Ernmas had three other daughters, Bau, ba Macha, Morigu. <clears throat> and that's interesting because they're often uh, assumed to be three uh, different uh, uh, three different heads of one deity or three different representations of one deity, Bau or Bab, Macha and Morigu. And Anna, of whom are called the Paps of Anna, in Urlochar, was her seventh daughter, Bao or Bob and Neman are the two wives of Nech, son of Indui, two daughters, to Elkmar of the Brew. And of course, that is Sheon Brew or Sheedenbroga, Newgrange, as it is known to you and me.
Ulan Feidbar Jarag. Jarag means red something or other. F-A-E-B-A-R, -E Feidbar. Ulan Feidbar Jarag, son of Khaikar, son of Nama. At his hands fell Mananon in the Battle of Kulind. Bob of the Mound over Femen, that's Shi'ar Femen, son of Yochugarb, son of Dwi Temen, son of Bres, son of Elida, son of Del Delbyth, son of Nech, in brackets. Abians, is that Abi -E -E -A -N or Abkan? I'll look for the Irish. It's Abkan. Abkan, son of Bek Felmash, son of Con, son of Dean Kecht, the Bard of Lu, son of Ethlew. Oh, <laughs> it's exhausting. Angus, the Mock Oak. And imagine that there have been scholars who have actually gone through all of this material and dissected it and tried, tried to figure out who is who. Uh, and of course, you find that someone is mentioned as being a daughter of somebody and it turns out that she's actually mother of someone else and it turns out she's the sister of someone else and then something else, she's a daughter of someone else and it all gets very complicated. Anyway, I'm going to skip all the rest of the lists of son of, son of, son of, son of, son of. Bridget the Poetess, daughter of the Dagda, she whom we did an episode about not too long ago. Uh, this is the same Bridget who was originally a goddess and who, who, who was later a saint. And, and it is assumed by the scholars uh, who've, who've uh, examined her uh, life story as a saint that she is indeed uh, merely a, a Christian version of something that was before there before. Bridget the Poetess. Daughter of the Dagda, she had Fay and, and men, the two royal oxen. Uh, in, in Irish, Fay, F E, and Mian, M E A N, from whom Femen is named. She had Thria, king of her boars, from whom Thrahirna is named. With them were and were heard the three demoniac shouts after rapine in Ireland, whistling and weeping and lamentation. She had Curb, king of the weathers from whom is Mag Kirb named. With them were Kerman and Kermach and Mach Og. He is the same whom speech messengers, with a, with a question mark in brackets after it, he is the same whom speech messengers summoned into the mounds of Fligish, or Fleish, whence, whence is named the cattle of Fleish. Or these were her four daughters, Arden and Beichwila and Denand and Beithtehe. Now let me just see. Yes, yeah, so there's lots of son of, son of, son of here as well. Let's get to the interesting bit. Some of this is repetition as well. The two of the Danon first invent invented battle shouting and uproar. <laughs> so if ever somebody tells you there was uproar in the house, you can tell them that, that uproar was first invented by the two of the Danon. For this reason, they invented shouting for fear of keeping bad watch on the homestead. Uproar for lamentation at coming in pains. Ma, son of Omor, was the druid of the Tuatha de Danann. That's M-A-T-H. And in, in Irish, Maha, M-A-T-H-A. And that is very, very, very interesting. And at this point, I am going to make a mark on that. <laughs> Some of you will know the reason for that. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. Yes, I'm just going to put one of my little... Um, my little peel off sticky things in the side of the, the book sticking out so that I know where to find that. That is rather interesting. Sorry about that. I'll go and turn on the lights as well. Ma, son of Umar, was the druid of the two of the Danon. Lou, son of Ethlew. And, 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 and it's spelt variously Ethna or Ethlin or Ethlew. The first who invented an assembly and horse racing and contesting at an assembly. And that is, of course, uh, the Irish for assembly is Enoch, uh, spelt here E N E C H, Enoch, or, or uh, O E N A C H. Now, the two of the Danon gods were the craftsmen, non gods, the hun's husbandsmen. And this is very interesting because of the aforementioned uh, attempts on behalf of the uh, scribes uh, to make the Danons human. But here there's a distinction because it says the gods were the craftsmen and the non-gods, the husbandsmen. They were the three gods of Dana, from whom were named the two of the Danon, to wit, the three sons of Bres, son of Elida, Thrill and Brian and Ketch. 
and and or Brian and Yochar and Yochara, who are the three sons of Turin, and we met those in one of the very first episodes, uh, the the tragic story of the sons of Turin and the revenge that Lou took upon them for their murder of Lou's father, Cian. Uh, the three sons of Turin, Br Bicriel, i.e. the three Druids, from whom were named the Tua de Danon. And it is they who broke the Battle of Moitura against the Favori and the previous battle against the Fervolog. And in that first battle, his arm was hewn from Nuadu and his head in the last battle. Nine kings, they couldn't fix that. They could give him a silver arm and grow some new flesh for him. But they couldn't sort out his head once it had been lopped off. <clears throat> Nine kings of the two of the Danon reigned, and they were in the princedom 200 years, all but three years. Though some say that the two of the Danon were demons, saying that they came unperceived, and they themselves said that it was in dark clouds that they came after burning their ships, and for the obscurity of their knowledge and adventures, and for the uncertainty of their genealogy as carried backwards. But that is not true, for their genealogies carried backward are sound. And of course, again, this is undoubtedly an interjection uh, by somebody in one of the monasteries who's trying to make them human and trying to make them uh, uh, less uh, deity-like uh, and more mortal. How be it, they learnt knowledge and poetry, for every obscurity of art and every clearness of reading and every subtlety of crafts, for that reason, derive their origin from the Tua de Danon. And though the faith came, those arts were not put away, for they are good, and no demon ever did good. It is clear, therefore, from their dignities and their deaths that the Tua de Danon were not of the demons, nor were they she-folk. It is said that Behach, son of Yardan, was chieftain of that taking and of the arts, and that seven chieftains followed him. Dagda, Dienkecht, Krejne, Luchne, Nuada Aragadlov, Lu, son of Cian, Lumakian, or Lumakain, it's usually given, yes, Mac, C-E-A-I, C C E I N in the Irish, in the English C I A N. Luma Cain, Goinu, son of Ethlu, uh, and uh, they were the seven sons of, of Ethlu or Ethna. Here are the names of their nine kings who took Ireland. Seven years of Nuadu before coming to Ireland. Seven, and this isn't even the third redaction yet. There seems to be some repetition. Seven years, Bress till the arm of Nuadu was healed, 20 years thereafter to Nuadu, 40 years to Lu, 80 to the Dagda, 10 years to Delbaith till he fell at the hands of Cacher, 10 other years to Fiachnu till he fell at the hands of Ogan of the Creeks, <laughs> C-R-E-E-K-S, 30 years to the three sons of Kermit, Makol, Makecht and Magrania till they fell at the hands of Eber and Eremon and Amorgan. And that there is the ending or pretty much the ending. The Gael were in Ireland and the Greeks in high kingship that year of the Tua de Danon is the following wisdom and there are a couple of poems. And thereafter, we follow to the third redaction. Have we time to skip through or to try and see if there's anything drastically different in the third redaction? Will I go and turn on the lights? I think I should because otherwise it'll become a little bit difficult to read. So this is the third redaction. Deep breath. Oh. Thereafter, the progeny of Behach, son of Yarbonel, the soothsayer, son of Nemed, were in the northern islands of the world. Does this all sound familiar? It's like Groundhog Day. Every day we're going to stay indoors and we're going to read a new redaction of Lower Gawala, learning druidry and knowledge and prophecy and magic till they were expert in the arts of pagan cunning. No mention of that word diabolical. And here in the third redaction, we also have the connection to Greece. They came from the Greeks and took territory and land in the north of Alba, that is Scotland, or sometimes Alba refers to the whole of Britain, at Dobor and Ordobor, somebody uh, maybe some of our Scottish friends might know what the, what those names are or where they might be. 
And they were four years there with Nuadu, son of Echtach, in kingship over them. And Katrina is saying, ah, mine was the first redaction. Explains a lot. Yes, exactly, because there are three separate redactions. And in, in uh, a couple of the redactions, sometimes, uh, again, there are uh, ver variants of the tale according to which manuscript it came from. I wonder how many additions we'll have here. <laughs> well, uh, the third redaction, as far as I uh, am aware, is the last one that we currently know about unless another manuscript turns up so somewhere. And you never know. Maybe somebody has a another copy of Lara Gawala in their attic somewhere that we don't know about. The four cities in which they were acquiring knowledge and science and diabolism. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun there, didn't I? These are their names. Phalias, Gorias, Findias, and Murias. From Phalias was brought the Leah Fall, which is in Chower, and it would not utter a cry, but under every king that should take Ireland. But from it is Inishfoil and Magfoil named, and of course, or my foil. Inishfoil would be the island of foil, uh, presumably the island of destiny, as it's, as it's known, and Magfoil or my foil, uh, which would be the plain of foil. From Gorius was brought the spear which Lou had, the spear which he had. <laughs> it's a funny one, isn't it? On Schleg B Egg Lou. Agorius Togu on Schleg B B A I Fada. Uh, uh, and in modern Irish, that would be, you know, a V Egg Lou uh, without the A in it, Egg Lou. Battle would never go against him who had it in hand. From Findius was brought the sword of Nuadu, and no man would escape from it by reason of its venom. And when it was drawn from its battle scabbard, there was no resisting it. From Murius was brought the cauldron of the Dagda. No company would go from it unsatisfied. There were four great sages in those cities. Morfessa, who was in Phalius. And as we said, I suggested last night, and Katrina, I'm not sure if you commented, uh, I was wondering whether Morfessa might be a, uh, basically mean uh, Fassa meaning knowledge, as in Bradon Fassa, and more meaning big. So in other words, that this uh, uh, individual's, this sage's name basically means more knowledge or great knowledge. Not more, sorry, great knowledge. In Valius, Esrus, E-S-R-U-S, in Gorius. Isikias, U-S-I-C-I-A-S in Findias, and Semesh, S-E-M-I-A-S, Semias in Murias. Those are the four poets from whom the Tuatha Danann acquired wisdom and knowledge. Therefore, sorry, thereafter, the Tuatha Danann came into Ireland. Their origin is uncertain, whether they were of demons or of men. But it is said that they were of the progeny of Bioch, son of Yarbonal, the soothsayer. In this wise they came, without vessels or barks, presumably that means a, a, a tree bark, you know, which is what you which, which what you might sail in down the river. Uh, Katrina says, more fios fasa. Mm, so uh, I'm hoping that's maybe what he basically means, uh, this great sage from Findius. Sorry, Phalius, Morfessa. Great wisdom or great knowledge. In this wise they came, without vessels or bark, barks, in dark clouds over the air, by the might of Druidry, and they landed on a mountain of Conmacnarain in Connachta, that is, the mountain of the sons of Delgai in Conmacnarain or Conmacna Quilla. The Fervolag were there, and they saw a great cloud of mist upon the mountain of Conmacnia. It settled down on the mountain a day and a night. So this is giving more information than we've seen in the other redactions. It's actually specifically saying that they saw this great cloud descend upon the mountain of Conmacnia rain in, uh, uh, in Connacht. Such was the greatness of the mist that they feared greatly before it, and not a man dared to go near the mountain. They approached it afterwards on the second day and saw the troops on the mountain after that cloud and their number was greater than was apparent. But another company says that the Tuatha Danann came in a sea expedition into Ireland and that they burnt their ships thereafter and that it was owing to the fog of smoke that rose from them as they were burning that others have said that they came in that fog. Not so, however, for these are the two reasons why they burnt their ships. 
that the Fomori should not find them to rob them of them, and that they themselves should not find them to flee from Ireland, even though the rout should fall upon them at the hands of the Fir Volug. The third reason was, lest Lou should find them. So there's a third reason here in this redaction. Lest Lou should find them and to battle against Nuadu, son of Yachtuk, king of the Tuatadanan. So that of these reasons the learned sang, and there's a poem. Thereafter, the Tuatadanan brought a fog over the sun for the space of three days and three nights. They demanded battle or kingship of the Fir Volug. Thereafter, a battle was fought between them, to wit, the Battle of Moitura. And of course, the first Battle of Moitura is called Ka Moitura Kong. Said to have taken place in the vicinity of Kong in County Mayo. Second battle is the one that was fought near Loch Arrow in Sligo. And uh, the second one is the one, uh, Ka Moitura, uh, which we featured in the episode about uh, Morrigan with uh, Morgan Daimler's work. Uh, Caught My Chura is about the second battle. They were a long time waging that battle and it went against the Fir Volug and the slaughter pressed northward and a hundred thousand of them were slain from My Chura to the strand of Yohal, the right, E-O-T-H-A-I-L. <laughs> yeah, it actually says, yeah, Marvu Kage Mila Jeev O Moichura. A uh, hundred thousand of them uh, died uh, at uh, O oh, from Moichura. Go Trai Mohala in Sar, uh, T S A I R, which is. Uh, and there's notes for an awful lot of the Irish words too at the bottom of the page. Tor, T A I R, which presumably means a right. Um, but that's really interesting because we say Cade Mila Fulgia and they say uh, uh, Cade Mila, uh, Marvu Cade Mila, 100,000 were, were, were killed in the battle. This is the reason why the route went to the strand of Yohal. First seized Yochi, son of Urk, in the battle, and Yochi was the king of the Fir of Olug and the king of Ireland. And he found no water till he reached the strand of Yohal. Everyone followed the king out of the battle. And out of the battle did the three sons of Nemed follow him, Loan, Kesarb, and Lochra, and they slew him and buried the king in the stone heap of the strand of Yohal. That is the correct version. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Because you see, this is again where the story diverges into two. Uh, so I've read this one. So the shorter one, which doesn't have the words, that is the correct version under it, it says, There Yochi, son of Urk, was overtaken, and he fell at the hands of the three sons of Nemed, uh, son of Baura, namely Kesarb, Loam, and Lochra. Howbeit, the two of the Danon suffered heavy loss in the battle. Everyone who escaped of the Fir Volug and any of them who had no desire to be in servitude to the two of the Danon, they went out from Ireland in flight, and came into Ara and Islay and Rachra and Man and the islands of the sea besides. <laughs> Pardon me. The Fir Volug were in those islands uh, to the time when the provincial kings ruled Ireland, and the Krutne dra drave them out of those islands. Thereafter they came to Corpra near Fir, and he gave them land, but they could not remain with him for the severity of the tax that was imposed upon them. Thereafter, they went in flight from Corpora under the protection of Maeve and Alil, and they gave them land. That is the wandering of the sons of Umor. Angus, son of Umor, was king over them in the east. From them are named the territories Loch Kima, from Kima, the four headed son, Umor, it was it named, and the headland of Taman in Medriga, from Teman, son of Umor, and the fort of Angus in Ara, from Angus, son of Umor, and of course, that is. Uh, Dun Angus uh, in the Aran Islands, and the stone heap of Cunnel in the territory of Aijne from Cunnel, and Mag Adar from Adar, or probably I, I R A D H A R, and Mag Ashel, or, or My Ashel in Mumu from Ashel. Moin, son of Umar, well, Umar was the bard, M O E N. So the sons of Umar were in those islands, round about Ireland, till the Uli in the company of Cuchulain quenched them. It is the Tua de Danon who brought with them the great fall that was in Chower, i.e. the Leofoil fish, whence is Mag Foil, the name of Ireland. 
Leofoil fish. Yeah, interesting. L I A F A I L F I S. So they've added the word knowledge onto it, haven't they? He under whom it should utter a cry was the king of Ireland, till Cuchulain struck it, for he cried, it cried not under himself, nor under his fosterling Louis, son of the three fins of Owen. And the stone made no cry from that out, save only under Cun. Its heart burst forth from it, from Chower to Talchu. So that is the heart of Fall. Uh, it's, it's interesting how, by and large, the three redactions agree with each other uh, and are reasonably accurate in the retelling. Some of them, however, vary with details. Quenched, under sating. Yeah. I wonder what that meant, that they were out on the islands until the, the Ulstermen and Cuchulain quenched them. Um, sorry, where was I? Its heart burst forth from it from Chower to Talchu. So that is the heart of fall. However, it is not that the idols broke and that Louis obtained no kingship, but Christ being born at that time. Though Louis Redstripe was foster to Cuchulain, he was older than Cuchulain. Louis Redstripe was a pupil in martial matters of Cuchulain. Nuadu Aragatlov, he it is who was king over the two of the Danon there seven years before their coming into Ireland till his arm was cut from him in the Battle of Moitura. Edlio, son of Aldi, he is the first man to who fell in Ireland of the two of the Danon by the hand of Nerchu, grandson of Semyon, in the first Battle of Moitura. And Ernmas and Echtach and Ethargal and Fiacha fell. Bress, son of Elada, took the kingship of Ireland thereafter till the end of seven years until the arm of Nuadu was adjusted. Nuadu Aragatlov was king thereafter twenty years. He had a silver arm with full activity in finger and joint. Dean Kecht the leech adjusted it, and Kregna the right was helping him in the matter of that silver arm, but Mech son of Dean Kecht, set joint to its joint and vein to its vein of his own arm, and it was healed in thrice nine days, and he gave his silver arm to him as a reward. As for Talchu, daughter, I don't think that detail was in the earlier redactions, that Nuadu apparently gave Miak the silver arm uh, as a reward for making him a proper human arm. As for Talchu, daughter of Mymor, king of Spain, queen of the Fir Volug, she came, after the setting of that battle of Moitura against the Fervolog, to Coil Cuin, the wood was cleared by them, so that it was a clover, clovery plain by the end of a year. This is that Talchu, who was the wife of Yohu, son of Urk, king of Ireland, till the two of the Danon slew him. So Lou's foster mother was... Uh, 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 this is really interesting. Lou's foster mother, Talchu, was the wife of the king of the Fervolog, or the Fir Volug. And Lou's mother was a daughter, his real mother, was a daughter of the uh, uh, leader of the Fomorians, Balor. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Fascinating stuff. In the first battle of Moitura, and he is the first man who died of a spear point in Ireland at the beginning. It is Yochi, son of Urk, who took her from Spain from her father. From Ma my Moor, M A G H M O R, from the king of Spain, namely Talchu. It is Yahu, son of Urk, who was the first king of the Fervolug, or Fervolug, who sat in the beginning in Chower, even though he was their last king. And in his time, the mound of the three men was erected upon Chower, and the stone heap of the one man. Drum, Drum Cain. D or U I M C A I N was its name before the time of the Fervolog at the beginning. And of course, Drim Cain means the beautiful ridge. Now, Talchu, daughter of Maimor, dwelt in Talchu and slept with Yochu Garab, son of Duidal of the Tuatha de Danon, and Cian, son of Dian Kecht. Skal Balb was his other name, gave her his son in fosterage, namely Lu. He was son of Ethna, daughter of Balor of the Strong Blows, the Ildanach, whence it is said, if one have many arts, let him mer merit many recompenses. So she died thereafter in Talchu, and her name was given thereto, 
and that is her grave, which is northeast from the seat of Talchu. So that her games were celebrated every year by Lou, a fortnight before Samhain read Lunasa, and a fortnight after, so that thence comes the word Lunasa, i.e. the Nasa of Lu, son of Ethlu, is the name of that festivity. That's interesting that it should say Samhain when it should read Lunasa. Um, perhaps the, the scribe was tired uh, and hungry and writing under poor lighting, poor working conditions. Where 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 was his union representative to complain bitterly about the, con the awful conditions under which he was copying these these uh, these stories, you know, that he actually wrote Samhain when he was right. He was meant to write uh, uh, Lunasa, which is fascinating. Also fascinating is the fact that some scholars have suggested that the place where Tulchu was buried is in fact Loch Crew, and if that's the case, there's something interesting here. It says that, <clears throat> and that is her grave, which is northeast from the seat of Tulchu. And I wonder if that's the hag's chair at Cairn T, the seat of Talchu, which would make Talchu's grave northeast of there. But by how far will we ever know? Northeast by a long way of the hag's chair is Shlieve Gullion in Armagh, uh, which is associated with the Kalyak. So there you go. Nuadu Aragatlov fell, what time are we on? Five past nine. Nuadu Aragatlov fell in the last battle of Moitura and Macha, daughter of Ernmas, by the hand of Balor, Balar of the strong blows in that battle. Ogma, son of Elada, son of Net, fell at the hands of Indek the Great, son of Daedaunan, king of the Favori. It is in that same battle that there fell Brunya and Kashmail, the two satirists, by the hand of Ultrialach, son of Indek. Now, after the death of Nuadu and of those men in that battle, the Tuadadanan gave the kingship to Lu, and his grandfather Balar, grandson of Nech, fell at his hands by a stone from his sling. Many were slain in that battle, both Tuadadanan and Favori, and Bress along with them. As Indech the Great, son of Daedaunan, the king said, he was a man with arts of poetry and craft. When Lu asked of him, how many were there who fell in the Battle of Moitura? Seven men, seven score, seven hundred, seven fifty, fifty, nine hundred, twenty hundred, forty with net, ninety, that is, with Ogma, son of Elathan, son of net. Wherefore was this said in confirmation? And there's a poem uh, in between. Lu, son of Ethlu, was forty years in the kingship of Ireland after the last Battle of Moitura. There were 27 years between those two battles of Moitura. So again, all three redactions agreeing on certain points. Yochi Olahar, the great Dagda son of Ella, Elada, was 80 years in the kingship of Ireland. He had the three sons, Angus, Age, and Kermit the Fair. Upon those four did the men of Ireland make the mound of the brew. And in Irish, Isfora na Ciathrar Roskness said, I don't know that word, Fir Aaron Sheed Imbra, and that is the Irish for Newgrange. Fascinating stuff. And so that agrees with the first redaction, uh, which indeed said, sorry, which indeed said that um, the, the, uh, the men of Ireland made the mound of Newgrange over Dogda and his three sons, Angus, Age, A-E-D-H, A, I think that's pronounced A, isn't it? And Kermit, or Kermoj, the fair, Kermoj Cave, C-A-E-M-H. And I'm really fascinated about that because in the Dinshenicus story about Douth, it says that Douth was built by all the men of Ireland. Well, in this case, it just says Fear Aaron, the men of Ireland, doesn't necessarily imply all of them. Dian Kecht had four sons, Cú, Cian, Cehan, and Miak the leech, who cured the hand of Nuadu Aragablov. Etan, Etan the poetess, daughter of Dian Kecht, and she had for son Corpora, the poet, son of Ogma, and Aramage, the Shilich, another daughter of Dian Kecht. Yeah, I think somebody was saying earlier on that uh, Aramage helped with um, the mending of uh, Nuadu's arm 
Uh, and I think that that version of it is contained in Cot My Chura rather than in uh, Laura Gawala. Cringe Bell, although I will check that just to be double sure. Crind Bell and Brunya and Koshmail, the three satirists. Bayquilla and Danand, the two she husbands men. Uh, Coda is making himself heard. He's been quiet the past few nights. Three sons of Kermach, son of the Dogda, Makol, Makecht, and Magrania, Sehor, Kehor, and Tehor were their names. Fola, Bonda, and Eru were their three wives. So again, all agreeing with previous redactions. Fea and Neman were the two wives of Nech, Aliak Nech. Bo and Macha and Morigu and Anna, of whom are the paps of Anna and Luachar, and th the three daughters of Ernmas, the three, the sorry, the she husbandsman. The she husbandman. That Dana is mother of the gods, and these are her daughters, Arigjin, Barand, Bequila, Bethe. Goinu the smith, or Gobnu, and Luchna the right, and Kregna the carpenter, and Dienkecht the leech, the four sons of Esarg, son of Net, son of Inde. To memorialise the above, the poet Yochi Uflund Say, sang the following composition, and that would be uh, Yucky O'Flynn. Uh, that's very interesting. You know, to memorialise the above, it had to be put in poetic form, something that could be sung or recited very easily. Nuadu was 20 years in the kingship of Ireland till he fell at the last battle of Moitura at the hands of Balor. 40 years had Lou. I'm reading it fast because it's repetition. Till the three sons of Kermach slew him in Caindrin, that is, in Ishnach. 80 had the Dagda till he died of the gory javelin wherewith Kellen mortally wounded him in the great battle of Moitura. Dalbeth Af and Kellen, I'm sure, is the same name as the warrior in Toimbo Kulnga who is revived and, and healed of his gory wounds in the Shmiramar, the Bath of Marrow that we discussed, I think, in the episode about the Milky Way. Wherewith Kellen mortally wounded him in the great battle of Moitura. Delbyth after the Dagda, ten years in the kingship of Ireland, till he and Olive, his son, fell at the hands of Chaiker, son of Nauma, son of Nechton. Fiacha, son of Delbyth, took the kingship of Ireland after his father, ten other years, till Fiachna and the son of Olive fell at the hands of Ogan of Invermore. Twenty-nine years had the grandsons of the Dagda in the kingship of Ireland, to wit, Macool, Makecht, and Magrania. They divided Ireland into three parts between them and left no children. To them did the Gael come to Ireland, that is the Milesians, so that they fell at the hands of the sons of Mill of Spain in vengeance for Ih, son of Brogan, and Cúinge and Fuad. Those were the three sons of Brogan. And these are the nine kings of the Tuatha Danann, and the length of their computations, to wit, Nuadu and Bres and Lu and Dagda and Delbaith and Fiachna, Macool and Makecht and Magrania. So to memorise the above, the historian Tanija O. Dubshalach sang the poem, uh, poem number L.I.V. The genealogy of the Tuatha Danann here below, and the, there follows a long list of, you know, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, the five sons of, the three sons of, that is one of the two olives ascribed to, all of, no, oh my goodness me, it's long. Uh, so, like, you know, I think these um, are available online. The Laura Gawala is online. Um, so perhaps after we finished, if you want to read the entire genealogy of the Dedanans, you're more than welcome to try to pluck it apart uh, or to, 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 to piece it together, maybe, having plucked it apart. Bridget, the poetess, daughter of the Dagda. It is she who had fay and men, the two royal oxen of whom is feminine, that is, two oxen of Dill, of whom is my famine named. And with them was Tork Thria, king of the boars of Ireland, of whom is Mag Thriarne named. And with them with them were heard the three demon cries in Ireland after ravaging, whistling and wailing and outcry. And the Tuatha Danann first invented battle shouting and uproar. For this reason, they invented shouting for fear of taking on the place and plundering blah 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 sorry i'm going to pass uh, over because i'm conscious of the time and that we may need to make a little bit of time for commentary and questions making sure that i'm not reading any, or missing anything that's spectacularly important
Yeah, same thing. They uh, they're trying to to, to say that the the, the Danans were neither from demons or men, um, but um, every darkness of art and every clearness of reading and every craft of cunning that is in Ireland, they are of the two of the Danon by origin. And it's clear they're they're not of demons or of the she folk, for everyone knew that they took human bodies about them by day indeed, which is more accurate, and their genealogy is reckoned backward, and they were destroyed at the coming of the faith. Well, of course they were, or so the church would like to think, but the Dedanans never went away, not at all. Yeah. That is it. Well, that is our first uh, foray into Laura Gawala because, of course, we're going to do uh, at least one episode, if not a couple of episodes about the Milesians. We're going to do an episode about the Fir Volug, and we're going to do probably we'll combine the Partholonians, Partholon and Nemed into uh, into one episode. I think we will probably be probably do it that way. Okay, now let's see if we've missed anything in terms of commentary and questions. Shane Cody said, I'd assume quenched them means killed them, wiped them out on their relatives. Yeah, probably, Shane. That's probably exactly what it means. Mandy McCurl, husband, husband's men, farmers, handlers of cattle. I'm presuming that's what it means, uh, as in cattle husbandry. Now, I, of course, I can't remember exactly what page that was on, um, but I, sh I should be, and I think I did, but I didn't take note of it. Um, I should be looking for the Irish word. And what is the Irish word? Uh, and is that an accurate translation of it? What if all those son of is an encrypted message that they have some equivalent numbers in Irish alphabet for decoding? Interesting possibility, Karen. Um, I don't know is the answer, but it's certainly an interesting thought, you know. Lovely again, Alex. Uh, Cree, uh, yes, allergies. Uh, hope the dog is okay. Are you talking about my dog or someone else's? Sir? Obviously, I've missed loads of... Hope the doggy is well. Oh, sure. Look, let's call him in. Let's, let's call him in. Soda. Soda. Come here. Come on. And this is really curious. He's, he's sprawled across the three chairs in the kitchen, right? Under the table. And he's not budging. And he's looking at me as if to say... Are you calling me out there because you want me to go out into the yard? He's very suspicious. He doesn't. The door is not open. He's, he's not budging. I'm telling you. Come here. Come here. I bet you. I bet you if I had a big juicy piece of bacon here, he'd be he'd be out to me in a dash. Come here. Come here. They want to say hello. Come here. Good boy. Good boy. Come here. Come on to me. And there we go. Some of you might not be able to see him too well because there we go. Hey, look, look, say hello. Say hi, Mythflixers. Hi. You're tired. Hmm? What's the story? I haven't been saying much this past couple of nights, which has been great, except for the, was it two nights ago when you were barking at the cat on the wall? Huh? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Come here. Come here. There he is. He's getting big, aren't you? I know you'll pretty soon you'll be able to just hop up and you'll be able to see uh, you're out of camera there look say hello oh i hear food in the kitchen i hear food i yes i haven't got any good boy now hound of ulster do you hear me hound of leinster There, there, there be Coda. Yes, he's sleepy. You see, the thing is now he's he's getting plenty of exercise because all the children are at home, and during the day some of them are playing with him in the garden uh, because of the good weather. We've been able to use the garden, and then he's getting at least one walk every day, sometimes two, and so by the time it comes around to this period of the evening. Uh, he, he just kind of gets into this kind of slump where he's just, you know, he's a good boy, good little coder. He's not that little, Pat. He's getting big, I tell you. He's big and he's strong. Oh, he pulled the he pulls the hand off me when I, when I'm trying to walk him. Waggy tail, Kujas coda. 
Mouvanway says, don't you think that with all the historians being male Christian monks, that the strong female goddesses were written out of history a bit? That's a very good question, but perhaps it's not that they were written out, but their stature was reduced. I mean, at the end of the day, um, See, I have to be careful what I say. I don't want to offend anyone, you know. Um, and I mean, I was raised and have been raised a Christian, uh, although I'm, I'm 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 thoroughly agnostic now, as many of you will know, and I've said it on numerous occasions. Um, I don't think they were looking to uh, uh, wipe out a religion so much as to deprive it of its. Uh, uh, its power and its primacy. Uh, it's a curious thing that, in fact, that any Christian monk ever attempted to write down what was ostensibly pagan material, uh, and which was, uh, you know, uh, apparently um, unfavorable to their own religious outlook, uh, uh, and which, of course, presented uh, another alternative uh, authority in terms of deities uh, to the um, uh, the the people uh, of, of, of their age. Um, and as I said, and, and it's been written about plenty of times by scholars much more learned than I, that uh, the Christian scribes did everything they could to either demonize or to humanize the Dedanans. Uh, but the one thing that they failed to do uh, was to deprive them of that primacy completely. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that the tales survived uh, into the modern era, which they did, uh, and the fact that so many tales pertaining to the mythological cycle, but also the Ulster and Finn cycles, uh, survived into the 19th and 20th centuries is in indicative, pardon me, to me that this secret faith, as it were, that uh, survived in tandem or in parallel with Christianity all throughout those ages. So they failed in... Uh, and I think that it may have been uh, it may have been John Kerry that wrote this, and if it wasn't, uh, and I'm mistaken, please forgive me. But I think it was Kerry who said that in the end they realised that they shouldn't say anything about them because to say anything about them at all was to give them power. Uh, a little bit like you know when you ban alcohol, <laughs> you know, and suddenly there's moonshine being sold everywhere and shabins all over the place, you know. Um, but there is, um, I think. Uh, it's something I would probably have to do more research on in terms of, yeah, yeah. I think that you have a point in that the reduction of the role of the female appears to be known. I'm not sure that the female goddesses were written out of history, uh, but you're saying written out of history a bit. I definitely think that um, there was a, an effort made to, 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 uh, to deprive them of their power and to, to make them all human, you know. But now, at the same token, the reason that we know, uh, and so if you pick up a, 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 sorry, I know I'm going on on this one because it's an interesting point. If you pick up a, a, a dictionary or, or a, a, an encyclopedia of Celtic mythology and you look up the names of all the deities, the reason that we know most of the of know of, know about most of those deities and we know their connection to each other and, and the stories that they pertain to is because of those very same Christian monks. What would have survived of all that if it had been left purely to the indigenous uh, uh, folklore, uh, you know, and the indigenous retelling of stories? The the truth is that very little of it might have remained. Uh, Curiously, and perhaps a con in, a, in a contradictory uh, sort of sense, uh, the Christian monks actually saved a lot of our early uh, mythology from, um, not from destruction per se, but from from obsolescence um, with 
especially in the 19th century with the coming of the famine and emigration and death and and the mass emigrations that followed for the decades after the famine and the uh, the conversion of the uh, the ordinary folk to speaking english as their main language especially in the in the pale and in the eastern towns of ireland you know so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, somebody took great umbrage one time when I said that all the men of Ireland had built doubt, and um, they took uh, they took offence at that and said, "Why, why, why haven't you mentioned the women? You know, were the women not involved?" And I had to explain that the reason I said all the men of Ireland was because that's exactly what it, uh, the myth had said as to whether. Uh, there were women involved. I don't know. All I can do is re re retell the story as I have seen it. Okay. Anyway, that was a very interesting, uh, thought-provoking question. Uh, and of course, uh, there are many avenues of exploration with regard to Christianity versus paganism in, in Ireland. Yeah, uh, the two dogs were getting excited there. Josephine Meehan left us, and uh, good evening to you. Right, uh, I'm going to scroll right down to the bottom now and see if there's any more fresh questions. Or You make a good point that the myths may not have survived at all without the monks, says Muvanwe. Yeah, well, it's a point that a lot of people miss. And so, look, it's, it's just something that's worth bear, bearing in mind, especially when you see uh, commentary online, uh, especially throwaway commentary, uh, on you know the keyboard warriors on Facebook and that sort of thing, or you get into say a forum online and somebody saying yeah the Christians they did this and they did that and you know the evil Romans what did the Romans ever do for us the aqueduct you know it's like that it's like f for all the perceived badness um, they actually did a hell of a lot of good as well. Don't forget that uh, and this is a subject for a, a future episode don't forget that ireland is known as the isle of saints and scholars uh, and many of the pre-christian uh, tribal leaders we call them provincial kings or whatever you want to call them they became monks some of the abbots were abbot kings so they were both leaders of their territory in terms of politics and they were also leaders of their order in terms of their religion um, and the two things are very very existed very very closely in hand and don't forget also that the irish in the fifth and sixth centuries uh, embraced christianity open-heartedly and open-handedly now the developments that took place in the church and the misogyny and the, the deviancy of the church uh, I, I may be a much, much later thing that we're projecting backwards in time. There certainly seems to have been an age in, in the Middle Ages when, in fact, uh, as has been written, and this is the topic for said uh, episode, when the Irish saved civilization. Because during the plague and uh, during uh, the Dark Ages, uh, the great seats of scholarship and learning uh, and, of course, Christian uh, 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 re religion uh, were in the monasteries of Ireland. And from there, there was, a, 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 I suppose, a, a, a nascent uh, um, renaissance or enlightenment that emerged afterwards from Ireland. So we have to be very careful when we start going down the road of complaining and giving out about the Christians and what they did. The Christian monks of the Middle Ages, in fact, saved a lot of Irish myth from oblivion. Katrina says, the official interpretation is like how the Irish saved civilization, arrogance and propaganda, saints and scholars, official church interpretation, politics and church equals power, embraced, it is about perspective, deviancy new, I very much doubt it. Oh, well, I, look, it's all about perspectives as well. Uh, I am not very well read, it has to be said, uh, on medieval history, and it is an area of my own knowledge that is deficient. Uh, so perhaps I'm completely wrong and I'm going off on a tangent. Um, however, um, I I I I still stick to the uh, the claim and the suggestion uh, that a great deal of Irish mythological material was saved from oblivion uh, by Christian scribes, and that I think is a fact. I don't think that is an assertion. Sadly, in the USA, history tends to be taught as the history of war. So sad, and of course, I think someone else mentioned war uh, or history is written by the victor, uh, which is why you get. 
a universal truth in mythology that generally goes beyond. Um, and that won't, by the way, the, the initial discussion about how women have been reduced in mythology, that will not prevent us from um, hosting uh, lots of episodes about female deities, of which we have had several already. Carol says there seems to be a good evidence of the first Christians in Ireland were Coptic Christians, desert fathers, rather than the Roman. Well, I think what happened when Christianity arrived in Ireland, Patrick was uh, Romano-British, Romano-Welsh. Uh, what happened uh, with the establishment of our own version of Christianity uh, was that the Roman Empire at that stage was crumbling and uh, the authority of Rome was not uh, imposed so much uh, on the deviant Irish church or the deviant, I mean, divergent Irish church uh, until I think the 7th or 8th centuries. Um, but interesting all the same. And then lots of stuff there that could make some very interesting uh, topics uh, later on. Kork Naman Abu. Just making sure that I'm not missing any. I'm just trying to read through everything. I found giant stone snakes under St. Patrick's Chapel at Haysham near Morecambe. Giant stone snakes under the chapel. How did you find those, Don? Were you an, an archaeologist? Ihoa Anthony, thank you for tonight, says Alex. Good night, Alex. Yvette says, Credne versus Dian Kecht and Miach. Muvanway says, really, when I was in school, it was all Welsh history. That's a while back, mind. And I went to a Welsh-speaking school. Still, Bridget was made a bishop. That's important, yeah. <laughs> and one of the chief druids of Lyra at Tara was made a bishop by Patrick. Don't leave us out. We interpret the stories. Absolutely correct. You make a good point that the myths may not have survived at all without the monks. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Um, something I must go back and read more about, actually. In Wales, less than one hour per week, Welsh history is taught. Okay. Part of me wonders if the monks wrote the stories down because they had some respect for the history of the land they were in. That's what I like to think anyway. Ah, uh, look, uh, the truth is never black or white. It's usually in the greys in between, isn't it? Anyway, good night, everyone. Thanks for uh, a, 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 a wide-ranging, interesting, fascinating discussion, as always. Lovely to see you all. Stay safe, everyone. Keep washing your hands. Keep your social distancing up and hopefully you'll join us again tomorrow for episode 49 uh, and in the coming days uh, we have lots and lots of more interesting subjects to talk about history is very complicated and it's important to look at all the layers from different perspectives says Maeve Fina Callahan indeed it's very true and Ireland's history is very very complex so it is absolutely Sharon says night all says Katrina there's not enough time to read all the books says Henry you are absolutely right Muvanway says, thank you so much, Anthony. Good night, all, says Todd. Vicky Wallace Southall is giving hearts. David Rave Russell, keep washing your hands, folks. Good night, and Jules Cousins. Yes, indeed. Join us again tomorrow evening. It's an hour and a half now. These episodes are getting very long. So we'll change the tack tomorrow. We'll do something a little bit different. Good night, all. Kolosov and Slongafol. And YouTubers, Slongafol. <laughs>